Well, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Now, last week we finished up in verse 11 and 12, reading that again. These commands I teach, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. It took us the whole time to look at that. And so young Timothy, a young man, was being despised for being a young man. So it's hard to be a pastor when some of the people in the church despise you. Um, but if you've been a leader in any way, church or otherwise, you, you pretty much will always have haters. Um, because you're making decisions and you're directing things and everybody has something in their own mind how things should be directed and, and uh, you're just not going to get 100% in agreement all the time. It's just not going to happen. So somebody is unhappy with the leadership for whatever reason that just goes with the territory and Timothy had to realize uh, the way he's going to overcome the haters is by just being a solid Christian believer and a leader command and teach don't don't uh, even though you may be a timid in your character or maybe not the a-type personality that Paul was you still got to be a strong leader you can't be um, somebody that, that everybody sort of gets their way and nobody's ever clear exactly what is the direction we're going. Um, you got to be a clear leader, command, teach, lead. But the best way to put the haters in their place is not by out debating them or out strategizing them, but just being more like Jesus than anybody else in the building, in the room. You just got to say, man, that guy is just like Christ, and I have to respect that about him and to put them silent by that godly, godly lifestyle. And so we finish looking at the character of the pastor as we finished verse 12 last week. And now in verse 13 to 16, we begin to look at the task of the pastor. What is the duties for a healthy pastor to help create a healthy church? Well, Paul says, till I come, he had planned on coming and visiting and, and giving more detail to all this information, but he's giving sort of a, a skeleton version of what he wants to say, but he's, he's saying the important things clearly. But until I come, give attention to reading, number one, to exhortation, number two, and to doctrine, number three. Now, in this Jewish tradition, you would come together on the Sabbath, on Saturday, and the rabbi would roll out the scroll, of course, getting the scroll out of the cabinet and kissing it and a group of guys bringing it. It was quite a, a ceremony just bringing uh, out the scroll. But then they would have it a, a, a portion to read. And, and so they gave themselves a reading. Of course, you know, everybody didn't have their own copy at home. So this is it. <laughs> the only time you're reading it is when the rabbi pulls it out and reads it or one of the elders reads it. And so um, there, there was a good portion of that where they would just spend quite a while reading the scripture. I, I love that in Nehemiah 8, you know, when the wall was finally built and now they could meet in safety and people could meet in groups without being tormented by uh, the, the Arabs that uh, Sambalat and Tobiah and those that hated the Jews it says they got together in Ezra, they built a platform and built a pulpit. That's the only time we see a pulpit there in the Bible. And, and Ezra read all day long. The people stood all day long. And, and they, the various people gave it a sense, helped them understand what was being written, not only giving insight or commentary on it, just helping them understand the Hebrew and understanding the words and understanding what it literally said. And... Um, it's interesting if you look back through church history, often this would get revitalized where they would simply give themselves to maybe instead of a midweek service, it would just be a midweek reading. 
you know, this week we're going to read through the book of Ephesians or we're going to read the Gospel of Matthew. Or, and and uh, people came out for that. There was one group in particular, the Moravians. That's all they believed in doing. They didn't even believe in the teaching or the preaching of it. Congregationally, that's all they did. And interesting enough, they would do that as evangelism. The Moravians would just go stand on the street corners in England or America. They, they came to both. And they would just stand there and read the Bible. That's it. John Wesley, who had been a missionary to America, and uh, he said in his own journal, well, John Wesley went to America to... Uh, save men or lead people to Christ, but, you know, who is going to save John Wesley? And he ended up being chased out of America, having uh, an illicit affair with the lady, and it was a horrible situation. He's on the boat, coming back, and, and interesting, it, wa it was the German group of people and that, that, were that were not terrified by the storm. The boat was going to sing, and they weren't bothered at all. They were singing and quite at peace, secure in their salvation. And that bewildered John Wesley. But on, when he came back, he, there in England, there was a Moravian reading, the book of Galatians, and where it came to say that a person is declared righteous by faith alone. John Wesley said, as those Moravians read that scripture, his heart was warmed and he did believe. And at that point forward, he was quite certain of his salvation. So there's something to be said about that. You know, if you, you look at the statistics from time to time, most people who claim to be Christians and go to church have never read the whole Bible. A matter of fact, most Christians have read very little of the Bible. And um, they, they have no idea what's in the major prophets or the minor prophets. And, and uh, they've never even attempted to read Leviticus or maybe the first five sentences and they gave up on it. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the Bible's a pretty small book. I, I believe if you, you read it straight, it's like 72 hours of reading at a, at a medium speed. Um, if, you, if you read like four chapters a day, you would read the entire Bible every three and a half months, I believe it is. It's, uh, it's really not a tremendously big read. But um, most people haven't read the whole Bible. And of course, you, you do know there are many, many parts of the Bible that simply reading it wouldn't probably have, have as much effect on it because it is difficult to understand, needing to know the history in which it was written in. But nevertheless, that was something that Paul suggested they do in the church. Now, I might add, they're simply looking at the Old Testament at this time, mostly just the Torah, the first five books, but definitely um, the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, but the Pharisees accepted all the Old Testament in, in the same form as we do, arranged a little differently. Their last book of the Bible is not Malachi. But anyway, they arrange it a little differently than we do, have a little a few number less of the Bible than we do because they put some books together that we separate out. But they did read it all. So we're, we're talking, you know, for sure, Genesis all the way through the Old Testament. But on top of that, the letters of Paul, they had begun seeing those as scriptures. A matter of fact, even Peter himself, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, he actually tells, says that. He actually says in Paul's writings, which are a bit hard to understand, they are scripture. And uh, he makes it clear, this is equal to the word of God as the Old Testament and uh, indeed it was. So there was these letters of Paul, these prison epistles, as we're reading them today, circulating throughout the whole church. I, I, I should just spend one night teaching on canonization, huh? Because it is, it is so phenomenal, the confidence you have in the scriptures, where you see by around 350 AD how they came to the canonized Bible and how they left out some letters and some passages and added uh, the ones we have today. And, and boy, such a confidence you have when you realize how we got our Bible. It's interesting. 
in my life growing up, and even in my teen years and my beginning of my college years, you could not find a study Bible that did not have a large section on, on canonization. And I definitely remember a point in time in my 20s when I, somebody asked me a question. I said, well, have you read in the back of your Bible after the book of maps? Um, you'll see the book of canonization. And, and, have you, and it wasn't there. And I went to the Bible bookstore and started looking through all the various study Bibles. They don't put it in there anymore. And of course, today, a lot of the Bibles don't even put maps in the back anymore. And a lot of those things that were, but if you go back to an older study Bible, and all, as far as I'm concerned, all study Bibles should have that, but have a section on canonization. And of course, now with the internet, you just type in canonization and find somebody conservative and, and read on canonization of the scripture. Um, it, is, it is a wonderful topic. Of course, you could probably just type in YouTube canonization and hear somebody teach on it, right? Um, but either way, uh, Paul's letters were included. But I, I would say on the flip side of the coin, he was probably talking about Timothy himself personally. Personally, Timothy, you need to give yourself to the reading of Scripture. So really, one of the biggest differences between an elder, a leader, a bishop, an overseer, a pastor of the, ch of the church, is that we don't read the scripture enough for our own soul anymore we now have to read enough scripture for our soul and other people's souls not just to answer our questions but to study enough to answer questions that we're not even asking often people have doubts about things and questions about things we don't i have no doubt people have asked me do you doubt the existence of god ever it's like never not, not, not even a fraction of a second of a day do I ever doubt the existence of God. Now, I will tell you, there was a time in my teens that I did, and that's when I began to study apologetics. And I restudied it in, in, in my 20s. But I restudied it in my 20s, not for myself. It was to be able to help those who needed um, some questions to be answered so they wouldn't doubt whether it was the Bible, the authenticity of the Bible, or the existence of God, or, or whatever else. But, um, so, Timothy, you need to give yourself to the reading of Scripture, not only for your own soul, but enough to be able to pour out of your cup. You got plenty in your cup, but you got plenty to pour out upon others as well. And I'll tell you what, one of, one of the first things a pastor will experience who begins pastoring is they are so busy feeding and serving and helping and working in the church, they, they will go through a time where they stop filling up their own cup. And they're all of a sudden trying to pour out, and it's like, ah, oh, is there a drop coming out of there? It's dry as a bone. And they start getting dry, and they start struggling with sin, or they start stumbling in other ways, getting stressed out. And you just got to teach them, hey, you got to be a regular Christian first. Is a pastor just studies to teach, he's going to dry out. God wants a time with him where the pastor just seeks God in the word just to seek God. Not so he has a good sermon or, uh, you know, this will tie into the sermon or this will tie into the Bible study or this is a good verse for that marriage counseling I'm, I'm having. No, he's just reading the Bible for his own soul, for his own fellowship with God. And then he can study the word. And it needs to be enough, not just for his own learning, but for that of others. So the biggest promise in the Bible is found in Psalms 1, connected to the meditation of the word. You could say reading of the word. In Psalms 1, verse 2 and 3, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The way this actually reads is he makes it his delight. It's almost like it's the understanding, you know, our flesh doesn't want anything good <laughs> for us, right? This is my very first question when I get to heaven. God, why did you make donuts taste so good and be so bad for you? That was just wrong. <laughs> to me, the, 
one food that it should have more nutrients and, and health <laughs> should be the donut. You just enjoy it, and it's so good for you. It's just not that way, though. It's the opposite. It's, I do not understand these things. I almost fell away from the Lord over this discussion. But anyway, it's the same thing. We, we just, out of the 365 days a year, how many of those days do you got to kick yourself and prod yourself and force yourself to get on your knees and pray for two seconds or to read your Bible for three minutes or to, instead of, you know, listening to Country and Western Station, listen to a Bible study on Christian radio. You, 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 and then you go through a few months, a year, where you're literally having to beat yourself over the head, say, flesh, you're not getting your way. I don't care what you want. You're going to spend time in the Word and in prayer because you're a spiritual being, not just a fleshly being. You're not just a soulish being. You know, but I get so much out of the country and Western music. I cry all the way home, especially when that guy talks about his dog dying. It's just exactly like my, man, it just touches me so deep. I, I know that's, we're soulish. We're soulish. We like to laugh and cry and talk about our human common experiences. It's healing. It's part of the process. But that doesn't feed us spiritually. We're spiritual beings and we've got to be fed spiritually. And, um, and so, in maturity, we, we do that. But we got to fight these bodies, don't we? Things we don't want to do, we do. Things we do want to do or supposed to do. So blessed is the man who makes it his delight and keeps in it day and night. Wow. 365 days a year, solid. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, uh, that brings forth fruit in his season, especially David being a shepherd. He would be in some pretty barren areas around Bethlehem there. And you would only see oases where, you know, there was a place out in Brago Desert that I'd love to go. And it's just desert, dead, as dry as you can imagine. But you can start hiking up this trail and you will come to this oasis. And these trees are gigantic. And they've been there like 150 years. The palm trees are taller than you ever could imagine. And there's all kinds of greenery all around it. And there's this waterfall coming down. And it's just coming right out of the rocks. The water is there. It's a giant lake under the desert floor. And every time it rains 5,000 feet up in the mountains, that thing fills up first. And so, man, it doesn't matter how dry of a place you live. You tap into those waters underground, you're going to keep growing strong. That's what it's like when a guy taps into the word every day and every night. And it says he'll bring forth fruit in his season. I think it was Tozer who said, the saddest thing that earth will ever see is a soul who's saved but has no fruit to its account. People born again, saved, they know Jesus as Savior, they've accepted Christ as Savior, but yet they don't seek him. They don't follow him. They're going to heaven, but they spent, whether it was 10 years or 50 years on this earth after being a believer, they just never came to the place to become fruitful as a Christian. There are Christians like that. We know that, right? And so he says, you're, you're fruitful, whose leaf also shall not wither. And who doesn't need this final line? Whatever he does shall prosper. That's the granddaddy of all promises right there. You can't make a promise better than that. Everything you touch will be blessed raising your kids, being married in the workplace, in your hobbies, in your neighborhood, in your kneading bowls, in your fields, in your flocks, in the house, in the country, you're, you're blessed. And it all comes back to this thing, God's word. Do, do we realize this? It's, it's like God's DNA on earth. It's like God's fingerprint on earth. He made everything. And then we see his fingerprint the Bible, 
right from the beginning, it started. The word was actually the first thing we see at creation. God said. And that word eventually became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So it wasn't just a verbal communication. The word itself was a something that's as, as created as much as the earth and the sky and the trees. And it was spoken and eventually it got written. And then, of course, now it can be uh, spread around the world. As the Bible said, the word of God would go to the four corners of the earth uh, before Christ's coming. And, of course, now um, with technology that, that you know, it, it's unreal. And so who doesn't want to have that kind of blessing in their life, that kind of fruitfulness in their life? And it's just that getting it not in your head, but getting it into your heart. And then the exhortation. Now, I would just say there's times where we need to ask ourselves, are we getting this right with our English word? So pretty much, I look at the Greek on almost every verse before I teach it, or I have done it in the past, or I read commentaries that are doing that for me. I do it all different ways. Don't get bored that way. But the word exhortation in the Greek here is paraklasis, and it actually, the, the, more, the first translation of that would actually be comfort or consolation, or entreaty. It's, it's giving direction, but in a very kind and comforting, soothing, conciliatory way. It, it's not the guy up there at the Amway convention, you know, getting everybody all hyped up to go out and knock on doors and sell Amway by, you know, get their quota by the end of the quarter. It, it's not that kind of thing. It's, it's coming alongside Paracletus. Do you remember that? The one who comes alongside Paracletos. Do you know what that word is in the Greek? It's the word Holy Spirit. It's two words. It literally means to one who comes alongside and comforts. And, and this is almost the same word here is to say the one like the Holy Spirit who comes along and comforts and in gentleness and kindness and love encourages them to walk deeper in the Lord. Why, why is that so important? Because the deep motive of why we're obeying God is everything. If I am doing it and it's a mixture of fear and worry and guilt and shame and I don't want to be a loser and I, you know, and, and so, you know, I got to read my Bible. I don't want to be a loser Christian. You know, it, it's just God's not doing that. Remember, it's the shepherd and the sheep. It's the guy who's engaged to the bride-to-be. It's the father to the son. And, and in all those relationships, the sheep just has nothing but love and trust for the shepherd. You know, wants to cuddle with the shepherd. Wants to, you know, rub his nose in the shepherd's leg and wants to cuddle up when the shepherd sets down and, and you know, just like, wow, you know, this is the greatest shepherd in the world. He's just full of joy at the shepherd. The, the son looks up at the dad and just like, the dad's strongest and the smartest and the best and the biggest and, and the, the, the wife-to-be. It's, it's not the guy putting into this woman, hey, it's six months until we get married. I'm keeping an eye and trying to figure out whether we're, we're ever, ever going to get married or not or if there's somebody else better out there in the next six months I run into. And so she's like, oh my gosh, six months. I hope it happens. I hope it happens. And should I buy a dress? I'll buy a dress, but I'm, you know, I might be, not need to take it back. I don't, you know, there's just this constant concern and worry as she's heading towards her wedding day. Is that what's supposed to be like? No, 
So how does God want this with us? He wants our obedience, but only out of love and joy and thankfulness. And it's not because you're going to be a loser. You're not a loser. You're his child. You're his sheep. But we can be less fruitful and we can be more fruitful. We can be less strong in the Lord or we can be weak in the Lord. And, and the devil beats up on us and the world beats up on us and the fears and the worries and the lust and the greed and the bitterness of this world can, can just beat the heck out of us. So we can walk around as this beat up weak Christian because we're not building up our inner man. We want to be strong in the Lord and strong in faith and strong in the grace. And we have our shield up. So when Satan starts messing with us, man, we got a shield. We're not walking around without a shield. We got our sword and man, it's sharp. And it's, I'm practicing with that sword every day. So when I need it, I'm not defenseless. It's just simply that. And so we want to come alongside and we don't want to give a mixed message. Wow, yeah, you know, I haven't seen you at church and you really, man, I've been sinning like that. Wow, I don't even know if you're saved. You might want to come back to church and, you know, go back, go down and get saved again, you know. I don't know if you're saved. I don't know if you're right with God. You know, it, it, it's not. It's like God loves you. We love you. You're God's child. You're going to heaven it's just, you're, you're weak and you're getting beat up and it breaks my heart. I know it, God breaks God's heart and there's fruit that you could be bearing that you're not bearing. <laughs> you're bearing no fruit right now. God wants you to bear a hundredfold. And so we can exhort one another in a very loving, graceful, full of faith way but giving them the message, assuring them of the message of God's love and of God's goodness. James 3, I love this. I think it gets it right. I think there's a great balance here. In James 3, verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. I love that. And then he goes on to explain it in verse 17 and 18 of James 3. For the wisdom that is from above, it's first pure, secondly, peaceable, third, gentle, the next one, willing to yield. What else? Full of mercy, full of good fruit, without partiality, without hypocrisy, for the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And we know that Hebrew word, right? This, this letter starts James to the 12 tribes of Israel dispersed. It's, it's a Jewish letter. The word peace is the word shalom, right? Which is healing, wholeness, fullness. So to those people that are coming from that healthy place, that whole place, and they're coming with a clear doctrine of Jesus and, and, his, and who he is as our Savior and our Lord. And, and they're just coming alongside and they're full of mercy and good fruit. And, and they're sowing in peace and gentleness and, and kindness. And I mean, isn't that, isn't that what we see in the scripture? With the prodigal son's dad, isn't that what we see when the son comes home? What about the, the Jew that got beat up along the road? Remember that? Or the, excuse me, the Samaritan that got beat up along the road. Do you remember that story in the, in the Gospels? I obviously don't. And uh, <laughs> anyway, the guy who finally came by and picked him up and put him on his own donkey and, and, and took him to an end and paid for it all in advance. There was just a kindness in, in taking that beat up and wounded guy and uh, there was no judgment or or self-righteousness about it I love that and so I, I just I can't explain enough how important this is to our health and to the health of the body that when we come together that we share with one another what God is doing in us so you give yourself the reading of the scriptures you parents, give reading to your kids 
in a family devotional time. You husbands, give reading to the scripture to your wife, washing her in the water of the word. To your own soul, give reading. When? Well, it doesn't really matter when you start it. It just needs to keep going 24 hours a day, right? Day and night. It's, it's not about getting it over in five minutes. It, even if you read it for five minutes, that's sort of irrelevant. It's really, did you read enough to keep it going for a 24-hour period, you know? And, and you just keep that thought and that meditation and God speaking deep into your heart to those, those scripture. And... Um, and then to share it with one another. That's the key. So people often, how do I witness? Just share what God gave you. Just write, just write it down. Maybe it's a verse or maybe it's a psalm. Maybe it's three verses. Write it down four times on paper and give those four papers out. You're, you're, give it out at the gas station. Stop by every morning at the ANT. A.M. P.M. and give it to the clerk and drive on your way. God will show you. Put it on the, the mailbox or put it under the put it on the edge of the mat of your neighbor every day. And and they're like, well, what, what's that mean? Well, I'll tell you what God spoke to me this morning about that. You, you know what? I, I really think that you could share what God shared with you with somebody every single day. At least the one, if not 10 people, right? How many of you guys got Facebook or Instagram? You know? Um, And what's going to happen is people are going to get saved. And there's your opportunity to begin to disciple them through the Christian Foundation and then through the Gospel of John or whatever. But I, I am taking this and say, brothers and sisters, exhort. Give yourself to reading and then exhort non-believers, weak believers, believers that are strong, just washing one another. I love that in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Do you see that? He's not talking to a pastor here. He's saying for all of us to take the word of God that's been richly in us and teach it, admonishing one another. What's it look like? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's poetic. It's living. It's beautiful. It's not this religious, you know, some Mormon at your door, some Jehovah Witness at your door, you know. And it's just like, oh man, I don't need religion. I got enough junk to deal with in my life you know I don't want to be walking around with a briefcase on Saturdays you know what what are you doing get out of here you know yeah it's it's but you'd be you'd be amazed how many people in the world still respond even to the heresy because they're hurting people especially right now in the COVID so many people are committing suicide that that just tells me that people are hurting and they're probably willing to listen to anybody and anything. They're probably trying to get a devotional thought off of the Star Trek TV show. Um, and so, yeah, guys, get it out there. I exhort. And then the third thing here is doctrine, which is sound teaching. And I just happened to, you know, toot our own horn here at Calvary Chapel. I think we do it better than any other group. I really do. We really do teach the Bible verse by verse pretty much. It's our claim to fame, and uh, I think we are pretty good at it. And so to wrestle with those scriptures until we get sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy 2.15, he tells him later basically the same thing in the second letter he writes to Timothy. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So he adds on to that saying, Sound doctrine, man. Give yourself to sound doctrine and you got to work at it. It's not going to come easily. You know, uh, God has the animal cookies on the bottom shelf where even the little infants can knock the big plastic tub over and eat a few animal cracker cookies, right? But for the mature, you got to get in the freezer. You got to thaw out the steak. You got to get the barbecuer going. You know, you, you got to, it's, it's, it takes a lot of work. 
In the same way, when you, you begin to progress in your life in the Lord, you got to go deep and it starts taking work, but joyfully so. Well, in verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. So at some point, and it sounds like it was there in Ephesus, as they were praying for people, it sounds like they were praying to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. When we're first become believers, God's Spirit comes into us. We see that in John 20. Jesus is there physically on earth still after his resurrection. He breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in them. But then we see an exhortation at the end of Luke and then also in Acts where they say, now tarry for another work of the Holy Spirit. This is where you're being baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had no idea what they were looking for. But when the day of Pentecost fully come, the Holy Spirit came upon them. It was already in them. Now it came upon them. And they spoke in tongues and cloven tongues of fire. They were filled with boldness and the ability to be a witness. Peter got to be the spokesman in that scenario. And 3,000 people became believers. So evidently here... Uh, they lay hands on Timothy, and as they prayed, and somebody had a word from the Lord, what a, a gift of the Holy Spirit was going to be in his life, or a ministry of the Holy Spirit was going to be in his life, and he began to see that operate in his life. And, uh, and then, for whatever reason, he, he just stopped working in that area. He just started neglecting the, the work of the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we, we could look first at the gifts of the Spirit and then also the ministry of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are in John, or 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 through 11. The diversity of the gifts with the same Spirit, their diversities of ministry with the same Lord, their diversity of activities with the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, another word of knowledge through the Spirit, another faith by the same Spirit, another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, another the working of miracles, another prophecy, another discerning of the spirits, another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. To one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So I'm not going to teach this tonight, but there are supernatural gifts whether that's the word of wisdom or knowledge or faith or discerning of spirits or healings, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, that God, and it says he gives one of these to every single believer. Every one of us has some supernatural gift. So Mark, the end of Mark says, those supernatural gifts are when we go into the world and we are witnessing to non-believers that in many cases God will help us supernaturally to help them to believe. And that's exactly what it says if you read Mark 16. That's what those supernatural gifts are for. Now, he does use them sometimes in the church as well to minister to the believers, but that's not his first usage. His first usage is as we are witnessing, the signs will follow to confirm the word that is preached. Then there are the ministries that God gives in the Spirit. In Romans 12, verse 6 through 8, having then gifts differing according to the grace that has been given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let them prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let it use it in the ministering. He who teaches in the teaching, he who exhorts in the exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And, I, you know, there's definitely more ministries than, than these, but here he gives a, a pretty good indication that these things, you once you have them, you got to give effort to continue them. That's basically what he says in each one of these. God's giving you grace. He's giving you this ministry, giving you this gifting, but now it's diligence on your part to work out that ministry in your life. And in each and every case, you, you have to have faith. 
You can't complain about it, but you need to rejoice in it and you need to give your effort to it to see that ministry, uh, that gifting to its full success and continue in your life. Peter, Timothy was neglecting those things. We see in Acts 19 uh, an example of the laying on of hands. We don't know the example with Timothy here. We don't have this story in Acts or in Ephesians or anything. But in Acts 19, when he first came to Ephesus, he found a group of guys that weren't, they were Jews, but they weren't, they were excluded from the synagogue. And, and we, he found out they were a church of John the Baptist followers. And, um, and, and so when Paul finally realized that, he's like, wow, did you guys believe in the Messiah? They're like, we don't know who he is. John said he hadn't come yet. And he said, well, have you, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? And they're like, holy what? We didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. And in Acts 19, then after he baptized them in water, in verse 5, in Acts 19, verse 6, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So like back at the day of Pentecost with the apostles, they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. In 2 Timothy, Paul has to continue to encourage Timothy. He didn't obey First Timothy, if you would. But in verse 6 and 7, he said, I remind you again to stir up the gift of God which is in you. That word is to blow on the embers of a fire and get the fire going again. And how did you get this? Which you got through the laying on of the hand. So clearly talking about the same thing as in 1 Timothy. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So let me just say this from my personal experience, that when you begin to operate in the supernatural realm, Satan is not going to leave you alone. You're now on the front lines of the battle. And he's going to bring in confusion. He's going to try to bring in and make you look foolish. And, um, and you, you really do have to be strong in the Lord. You really do have to be walking in the spirit, full of the word, full of prayer, full of uh, being filled and keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is a battle to, to operate in that realm. I can tell you some stories and probably will eventually. But I'll just leave it at that, that I do understand why Timothy just sort of chilled out on the supernatural realm because it gets messy and you're on the front line of the battles all the time. And it can get exhausting. But we've got to stay in the battle and use all the gifts, all the ministries God's given to us. Well, in verse 15 now, Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. So Timothy has, you know, he's really close to Paul. He's a son in the faith. You know, sort of like, ah, okay, Paul, I've heard you say these things before. Good advice. You're right on as always. And, and just sort of, you know, take the letter of First Timothy and put it in the pile and say, okay, whatever. And he's telling him, Timothy, you really need to work on applying this. Don't, don't just know the right answer. You need to do the right answer. There's two different things. There's one knowing the right way, and then there's a whole nother world to do the right way, isn't it? I mean, if we did everything we know right now, we would probably all look like bodybuilders. And... Uh, we would, we would be uh, full of energy and uh, probably all twice as wealthy as we are today, right? I, I mean, so, you know, knowing the right thing and doing the right thing are, are two different things, physical realm and spiritual realm. So, Timothy, you need to give yourself to doing this stuff. And when you give yourself, like all the other young men, we look at Samuel. He gave himself to his gift of prophecy, and it began to become evident to all of Israel that he wasn't just a priest. He was a prophet of God. We think of Joseph, the guy with the coat of many colors. You know, he was just a slave. <laughs> but then he went to prison. And then it became evident that this guy has the ability to run the entire country. I think of Daniel. 
He was just a little slave boy they brought to Babylon. But yet it became evident to everybody, not that he was just smart and all the school learning, but that God had given him gifts of the Spirit and he had wisdom from God. And even the Babylonians saw that. You can read back in Daniel chapter 1. Or I think of David. He was a shepherd. He killed Goliath. And then he started acting so wisely that they said, hey, we want you to be the generals of our army, even though he was still a teenager. And as a general, it said he acted more wisely than all the other men of Israel. And he went out and came in, and the people rejoiced. So young men can be amazing men of God, even at a young age, if they will give themselves entirely to their walk with the Lord. Well, what? Reading, exhortation, doctrine. And the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Pray, keep praying for the baptism and the work of God's Holy Spirit in your life. You know, I, I, I think right now in the Calvary Chapel movement, we are reduced to a lot of great speakers and you hear them on K-Wave all day and all night. But I rarely hear a man full of the Holy Spirit. Good solid teaching, but they are neglecting the gift of the Holy Spirit that they have. And I don't hear that word of prophecy, that word of knowledge, that gift of faith. And when, when truth, God really starts working in the power of his spirit, trust me, you will see a difference. And it comes by the people praying for their pastor, praying for their worship leaders and their men's leaders and their women's leaders and the children's ministry leaders. When we begin to pray and say, God, we want to see you in power. Because we, we want to be a people walking in that power. And then the power of evangelism will, will begin. We, it won't be me encouraging to go share your faith. You won't be able to shut up. I'm like, you know what? Leave your neighbors alone for a while. You know, <laughs> you, you, it, it, it won't be, you, you're so full of the Holy Spirit, you become a witness and, and night and day, it's hard to shut it off of what God's doing. And finally, verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Take heed. This is serious business, Timothy. You're speaking for the Lord. You're, you're running his church, God's church that he created, that he bought with his own blood. James 3 said, hey, be careful, those who are teachers in the church, knowing that you are going to receive a stricter judgment because you're not just living the word, you're telling people how to live the word. You need to be accurate and you need to be an example of it. You're not just a preacher that preaches and doesn't live it. It can bring such a stain upon the church, and it has many, many times, and we all know stories of pastors who have large churches, and then the, you know, the skeletons come out of the closet, and, and, and it's full of robbery and homosexuality and adulterous affairs and all kinds of evil stuff. Because Satan's no dummy, is he? If he can get a hypocritical pastor, he's not going to just expose him. He's going to first lead him down a trail of, of, of a bunch of dead bodies and a, a bunch of shameful acts before he exposes him, right? So as you read through your New Testament, guys, most of the time the word saved is this, not to be born again saved. Okay, the word saved is five times. And, and uh, you know, it says if you help a sinner who's struggling in the church quit sinning, you save yourself and, and uh, your own soul. <laughs> oh, wow, that's how I get saved. I find a weak Christian and help strengthen him and then I'm going to sure, for sure go to heaven. I've heard people say such things. It's like, no, 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 no. You're, you're simply... Saving the church from, from hardship and, and a person becoming fruitful. So that's all this is talking about there. So verse 13, he says, give attention. 
Verse 14, don't neglect. Verse 15, meditate and give yourself entirely to them. Verse 16, take heed and continue. In essence, every day we have to give our free will to working in the kingdom, right? Every day we're a good farmer who goes out and works in the field. And a faithful farmer will be the first to receive the crops. Every day we're a soldier in the army and we got to get on the whole gear, right? (laughs) And go to work as a soldier. And every day we are all ministers of the gospel, are we not? Today is the day for salvation. In your world, you look at all those people on the freeway, in the mall, the fields are white unto harvest. There are all kinds of people. You look on that freeway, there's all kinds of those people that are crying out in their heart, God, help me. God, save me. Help me, Lord. And there, there's many we know are on the verge of suicide. Many of them are just lost. Many of them are, are plagued by the Catholic doctrine. Many of them have been lied to about the Muslim teaching. Many of the young people have been taught communism, socialism, definitely an atheistic gospel in the education systems. In the last 30 years, getting your BA from most colleges, including Christian colleges, is also a minor in atheism. And this is just a fact. Doesn't matter if you're in political science or in the math department, those professors are doing everything they can. When you graduate, a true intellectual would not believe in God. And you know what? God's Holy Spirit is working a zillion times harder, convicting men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And their hearts are ready. The fields are white and a harvest. All it takes is one woman who's been married with five times before and living with the guy saying, I just met a guy. He seems really spiritual. You should hear him. And the whole city flocks. Okay? It, all we have to do is daily to realize We need to give attention. We need to not neglect. We need to meditate. We need to give ourselves entirely to this. We need to take heed. We need to continue. Not so we're saved. Not so we're not blackballed. Not so we're not a loser. But we're doing all these things out of the love for God. I want to bear fruit. I don't know. I, I may be dead next week. But between now and then, I'd like to have six good days of bearing fruit. We don't know how long we have on this earth, do we, guys? Okay? So you got saved. You're alive 10 years after you got saved. You have 10 years to bear good fruit and rewards in heaven. Or maybe you have 50 years. I don't know. I just know that we can't count on many, many years to blow it, not to be so fruitful. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to be so fruitful in the next five years, but as soon as I hit 30, as soon as I get married... As soon as I have my first kid, I'll start, you know, living fruitfully. Now, give ourselves entirely to it now, right? Well, we're going to have a couple psalms of worship. And if you, you want to come up and take communion, this is a time where you can come and just say, Lord, you, your body was broken for me. And that wasn't just the work of justification, but that's also the work of sanctification. That's, that's the work of not just redeeming me, for being born again in eternal life, but that's also to be fruitful and to be more fruitful, to bear 20-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold, to prophesy, to give, have gifts of healing, gifts of miracles, gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues, the gifts of healings, whatever it is, God, I, I come and you broke your body for those gifts of the Spirit. You broke your body that I'd be full of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you you broke your body that I would be a witness, a light into the world, a salt into this earth. And as you take that communion, just say, Lord, now as I take your body here, fill me up with your spirit. Be it unto you according to your faith. You know, the woman with the hemorrhage, 
She purposed in her heart, I'm just going to touch the hem of his garment and this thing I've had for 12 years, I'll be completely healed from. And she was, and Jesus didn't know. He stopped. He said, virtue's gone out for me. And he looked around. It was obvious to everybody that this woman had met the Lord in faith. And he said, woman, it wasn't my garment. <laughs> it's your faith that's made you whole. In the same way here tonight, you take that bread, touch the hem of his garment with that bread. As you take the juice saying, God, you have forgiven me. I am forgiven. I will be forgiven. All my sins have already been cleansed. I'm already holy and righteous before you. And I want to thank you for that. And just pray again, Lord, right now, cleanse me. I know today I have fallen short of the glory of God. I want to be cleansed. I want to be healed. I want to be white as snow. I want to be a, a, a light and a salt brighter than I've ever been. Be it unto you according to your faith. Meet the Lord at his table.